Amen. My first time ever coming to the beautiful state of Alabama. I have been in the desert for the last six months, so it's good to see some green trees and hallelujah. Have sweet tea. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If we can turn open in our Bibles to the book of John chapter number four. Amen. John chapter four. As you're turning there, I want to give honor. Amen. To your pastor, Brother Sutton, for the invitation to come. Uh, I didn't even recognize him in the foyer. And I was introducing myself as Evan. I didn't know who he was. So, uh, but you know, I, I, I got the call. And I'm going to tell you, you have the nicest pastor I've ever heard on the phone. And he... <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. And uh, he wasn't joking. We said a bunch of wild-eyed apostolics. Amen. Hallelujah. But, you know, we, we've never officially met until today. Uh, but, you know, anybody who's a friend of Brother John Shoemake or Brother Ari Proud is a friend of mine. And I hold those two in high respects. And those are some of our mutual friends. Amen. But I also want to thank Brother Collins for taking me out yesterday and picking me up from the airport. And uh, for the room, the basket, everything's wonderful. Amen. Amen. And I want to honor this church. Amen. I know you could have, uh, many, many of our visitors that are here today, you could have chosen anywhere to worship. Amen. But I'm glad you're in this place. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. John chapter 4, beginning in verse number 10. The Bible says, Jesus answered and said unto her, if thou knewest the gift of God and who it was that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest asked of him and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, sir, thou hast nothing to draw with and the well is deep from whence then hast thou that living water. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him. That's speaking about the Holy Ghost, folks. Hallelujah. It is a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither, to draw skipping down to verse number 28 the bible says the woman then left her water pot went her way into the city and saith to the men come see a man which told me all things that i ever did is this not the christ verse 28 again the bible says the woman then left her water pot and i want to preach to us for a few moments on this subject abandoning ship abandoning ship. I wonder if we can set our Bibles down. Let's go, Lord, and let's pray that would God would have his way in the rest of this service. Amen. Lord, we love you. We thank you, Jesus, for another opportunity to come into your house. Hallelujah, Lord, to feel your presence, to feel your power. God, we are praying that you would, you would speak to us, God, that you'd touch somebody's heart, God, touch somebody's mind. Hallelujah. I pray that you'd fill somebody with your precious spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Why don't you shake your neighbor's hand, give him a great big God bless you, and you may be seated. Amen. Abandoning ship. The Bible says that Jesus was with his disciples, and in the process of being with his disciples, the Bible lets us know something unique. It lets us know that he must needs go through a place called Samaria. Uh, it was, if you will, something that I like to pay attention to anytime the Bible says the word must or definitive words like shall, things that are uh, non-negotiable. Uh, and the Bible lets us know that Jesus must go through Samaria. In other words, there was a divine plan. There was something that was going to happen when Jesus got to Samaria. Amen. And, and I want to tell somebody today, it's very important that we look at times in which the Bible is so certain. Amen. You might remember the chapter before in John chapter 3 when Jesus said amen to Nicodemus, marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. 
Hallelujah. I'm glad to be in an apostolic church that understands. Amen. It's non-negotiable. It's not optionable. Amen. I don't care what your grandma told you, what your grandpa told you. If you haven't been born of the water and of the spirit, you can't enter into the kingdom of God. It's not... It's a must. It's a must. What shall we do, Peter? He said, you must be born again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many thankful to be in a church that preaches and teaches? You must be born again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for the gospel. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. That that was something that, you know what? The Bible says we must do, but thank God for the opportunity to do it. Hallelujah. It started out as a must, but it became something that we get to do. You get to be born again. You get to come to church. You get to lift your hands. You get to worship. There's something beautiful about coming into the house of God. And though there's some definitives in the scriptures, amen, if you look at what you were, amen, before before you walked in the building, when you get to come to church and you get to worship him for all of eternity, there's something beautiful about that. I wonder if we can give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So the Bible says he must needs go through Samaria because he was on a mission. He was going to do something. There was something that he had to do. The first thing I want to point out is that he was looking for a woman at this well. But I want you to notice that he met her at a place where thirsty people gather. And I have learned that Jesus will wait around in places where thirsty people congregate. I want you to notice that he wasn't at the library. He wasn't at the supermarket. Jesus didn't show up at the bank, but he was sitting at the drinking fountain, looking and waiting for somebody that was thirsty. And I've come to tell you that God still waits around in places where thirsty people hang out. That's why when we come to church, we got to be thirsty. We got to be hungry for the things of God. Hallelujah. Because they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. Is anybody thirsty? Amen. For more of God. Is anybody hungry for more of God's presence? Hallelujah. Why don't you let them know? I want more of you. I'm not satisfied with a little bit of Jesus, but I need everything overflowing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But this time, unlike most times, Jesus wasn't going for the crowds. Jesus wasn't going for the multitudes. He was showing up for one thirsty woman. And I've seen God time and time again step into services just like this one. Simply for one thirsty person. Might I remind you today that it was one blind Bartimaeus who cried out when everybody else said shut up. And he was the one that got his healing. It was the one woman who was willing to crawl through the crowd and touch the hem of his garment that was made whole of her issue it was the one wild man of Gadara that crawled all the way and he walked several miles to worship Jesus and it was the one that was willing to get his attention that was made whole it was the one short Zacchaeus that climbed up a tree simply so he could see Jesus what am I trying to tell you today that if you're hungry and you're thirsty you might seem small and insignificant but you can get God's attention you just gotta want it more than what everybody else thinks you gotta need it more than what everybody else says you gotta say God here I am in need of mercy here I am Hallelujah. Let's praise him all across the building and let's worship him. Let's let him know. Amen. You might be the only one. Amen. In your family that's hungry. You might be the only one in your family that's thirsty. But thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Amen. If nobody else wants it, Evan Hood wants it. If nobody else is desiring, I'm desiring. I need more of you, Jesus. I need more of you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated. Jesus made a special detour simply to strike up a conversation with this woman. He proceeds to tell her, if you only knew who you were talking with. 
If you only understood the power of this conversation, you'd begin to ask of me and I would give you water that would quench your thirst. Might I just tell somebody, amen, that every time, if we could understand that every time we step foot in the house of God, every time that we lift our hands in worship, every time that we bow our knees in prayer, there is still power in a conversation with Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You don't need a six-month dissertation. All you need is a conversation with the one that changes things. All you need is contact with the God of heaven and earth, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and he will change your life. Hallelujah. There is power. So Jesus wanted her to know, you got to recognize who you're talking to. You got to recognize, amen, who, who is standing in front of you. Amen. You got to recognize that you're not just any church in any church today, but you're in a Jesus name church. You're not just in a church that sings three songs, gives you coffee and donuts. Amen. But you're in a place where God's presence dwells. You're in a place in which the power of God will fall in a place in which he'll pour out his spirit like he did in Acts 2. Hallelujah. There's power every time you show up to church. There is power every time you worship him. There is power in the name of Jesus. But in spite of all of this, the woman noticed what she thought Jesus didn't have. She said, you mean to tell me you're going to give me water? You don't even have anything to draw water with. I've been saved long enough to meet people that when they come into church for the first time, they start looking at all the things they think God can't do. I don't know how God's going to do it. He doesn't have an NA program. He doesn't have an Alcoholics Anonymous. He doesn't have a five-week marriage retreat. He doesn't have something that's going to help my kids develop. I don't know how God's going to be able to do it. I've come to tell somebody today, God doesn't need what you think he needs to do what he needs to do. He's God all by himself. He's all powerful. And you ought to worship him in advance. Hallelujah. Before the battle's over, you ought to praise him. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I trust you. I don't see how you can deliver me, but I trust you. But I worship you. I praise you because you don't need what I think you need to do a life-changing event in my life. So she looking at Jesus. I don't think you can. I don't think you can do it. You don't have anything to draw water with. And Jesus, don't you know the well's deep? Don't you understand the depth of the well? All she could see, amen, was the depth of the well. All she could see was the problem. Can I break it down like this? All this woman of ill repute could see was her mistakes. All this woman could see was her shame and her guilt and how low Jesus would have to go just to get her a drink of water. And if you're not careful, you'll start focusing on your problem instead of God. You'll start focusing on your sin instead of your Savior. If you're not careful, you'll start looking at the depth of the well. But I've come to tell you, his arm is not shortened, that it cannot save. I've come to tell you, he's still in the reaching business. He's still in the saving business. Hallelujah. Do I got a witness under the sound of my voice that you remember? Does anybody remember the bar stool? Does anybody remember the drug addiction? Does anybody remember the day that Jesus washed your sins away? The day that Jesus picked you up and turned you around? Let's praise him for a minute. Let's praise him for a minute. I don't know about you, but you might not think he's able. But I know God's able to take a boy from a drug home, from the ghetto, and turn him into a preacher. I know God's able to pick somebody up at their lowest point. Let's praise him. Let's praise him. Thank you, Jesus, for your salvation. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy. Thank you for your grace that saved me, that loved me. That's what the Bible means when it says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, not when we were his friend, 
Not when we were worshiping him. Not when we were praising him. But when we're spitting in his face. Crying crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. There's something in the, in the divinity of Jesus. That said now is the appointed time. Today is the day of salvation. At the worst point they're at. At their lowest mistake. Now while we were yet sinners. I'll die for my people. He didn't wait for you to get good. And you can't wait to get good to get God. That's not how this works. You get God to get good. You don't wait to be righteous enough or good enough to fit in with everybody else. You get the Holy Ghost. You get Christ in you. And he changes everything. Hallelujah. He changes everything. So after all of that, this woman likes to ask a lot of questions she begins to have a theological debate with Jesus how many's met a few people like that hallelujah their life is wrecked. Their life is messed up. But you start talking to them about the saving power of Jesus. And all of a sudden, they become a theological expert. All of a sudden, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't even tie their shoes last Saturday night. But you start talking to them about Jesus. And they start saying, well, I don't know about all of that. I don't know about all that Jesus stuff. Amen. I don't really know if you know what you're talking about. I know my life's messed up. But, but you know, Grandma always told me this. And grandpa always told me that. And she begins to have this little debate with Jesus. She says, do you really think that what you're offering is better than what I got? Do you really believe, amen, that, that, that you, you are better than Jacob's well? Than our father Jacob's well. Are you really saying you're better than this religion that's been in my family for generation after generation after generation? Are you really saying that what you're teaching and what you're preaching is better? Yes, that's what we're saying. There's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's only one God and Father who is above all, through all, and in you all. It is better. It is better. Hallelujah. I would that somebody believe that this morning. That it's better. Hallelujah. It's better than any other religion. It's a relationship with God. She has this little debate with Jesus. And if she had a Bible, she wouldn't have to look very far to find it. All she'd have to do is turn open to the book of Hebrews. Simply book of Hebrews, if you will. You can break it down like this. It's basically the New Testament book of Leviticus. It has no problem talking about stuff like Jacob's well. It has no problem talking about the blood of bulls and goats, of high priests. It has no problem talking about blood sacrifice and the sacrificial system. But every time it talks about something from the Old Testament, it will relate it to Jesus Christ as being better. You'll find the main theme through the book of, book of Hebrews. You could sum it up in one word, better. That's why it talks about, amen, that we have, we, have, we have a more excellent high priest. His blood spake better things. If you start talking about anything from this old religion, amen, you can just relate it back to Jesus. And without a shadow of a doubt, it would be better. You want to talk about the blood of bulls and goats? His blood is better. You want to talk about high priests? He's a better high priest. You want to talk about all religions? Jesus is better. You want to talk about Allah, Buddha, Muhammad? Jesus is better. You want to talk about your girlfriend? Or your boyfriend I've come to tell you Jesus is better I would that somebody believe that today That Jesus is better He's better than any drug He's better than any compulsion He is better that's why at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. No matter what you put before him, you'll recognize he's better. No matter what you said before him, it's got to bow. You want to talk about sins? Just set it at the feet of Jesus and watch it bow. You want to talk about addictions? Put it at the feet of Jesus and watch it bow. You want to talk about depression? Put it at the feet of Jesus. Jesus and watch it bow because he's better because he's better let's lift up our hands and let's worship him come on somebody let's praise him 
Somebody's been wondering, is this really what I've been looking for? Yes, this is what you've been looking for. This is what you've been searching for. You tried everything else and it hasn't worked. I've come to tell you he is better. Let's praise him and let's lift up our hands and let's talk to Jesus for a minute. Come on, somebody, lift up your hands. Come on, visitor friend. I know it might be different, but lift up your hands and begin to talk with him. And you'll begin to recognize and realize you've been trying this all on your own. And you've been trying to do it your way. But your way ain't working. I've come to show you a better way. I've come to show you a new and living way. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. As soon as... As this woman recognized who she was talking with, she wanted this living water for one simple reason. That she never had to come back to the well to draw water again. Many of us through the years... If you've been raised around church at any length of time at all, I wasn't. Amen. I, don't, I didn't know who Noah was when I first got saved. Amen. But, but, but if you've been around, you can look at the scriptures and find out this was a woman of ill repute. And she came at a time when the other women had already come to draw water. She recognized where she was at. She recognized, amen, the severity of the type of woman she was. And she was sick of, of the glare. She was sick of the condemnation. She was sick of the looks and the glances that everybody else gave. And so she came when nobody else was there. But this day was Jesus different because Jesus showed up. This day was different because when she thought she showed up to church and nobody was watching and nobody was looking, she just all of a sudden realized Jesus was sitting on the well. Jesus was waiting for her. And there's people under the sound of my voice today. Amen. You showed up expecting nobody to notice. But I've come to tell you, you got the attention of Jesus. He's been waiting for you for a long time. It might have taken months or years to get you to this place but he's been waiting for you hallelujah let's praise him let's praise him hallelujah hallelujah you came amen you didn't know what you were going to find but you found Jesus and he's been waiting all this time so she wanted the opportunity to never come back to the well again and so Jesus said, all right, I want you to do something for me. Bring me your husband. And she recognized, I can't bring Jesus something I don't have. She realized... I got, I've had five husbands and the one I'm with isn't my husband right now. She recognized, amen, her condition. She recognized what type of woman she was. And Jesus was saying, I want you to bring me your husband. Amen. He, wasn't, he wasn't saying that because he didn't know. She wasn't fooling Jesus. It shocks me how many people think that their lives are fooling Jesus. You might fool the pastor. You might fool the church. You might be singing in the choir. Amen. And holding on to all these other things. And you might fool all your family. But nobody is fooling Jesus. Nobody is going to hoodwink Jesus. Nobody is going to pull the wool over Jesus' eyes. He was asking her a question. Can you be honest with me? Can you be real about where you are? Because Jesus can work with honesty. He wasn't asking her to hide the problem. He wasn't asking her to lie about the problem. He was wondering, can you be honest with me about where you really are? And when you're honest with me about where you really are, she said, I don't have a husband. And he goes, good. I'm glad you're honest because I know exactly where you're at. Amen. Once you recognize where you're at, I'll tell you where you're at. When you recognize, amen, the severity of your condition, we can talk about some things. I don't have a husband. You're right. You're right. You're right. But Jesus wasn't telling her to lie about it. He was saying this. I know your issues. 
I know your problems. And I'm wondering if you'll bring me your problems. I'm wondering. I know you don't have a husband. I know your problem. I know your situation. What I want to know is you're willing to bring it to me. Are you willing to bring your issue to me? Are you willing to bring your condemnation to me? Are you willing to bring it to me? And I wonder if anybody recognized in the Bible, in the scripture we read, that she bring all of the men of the city out. She didn't bring the women. She recognized, I don't got a husband. Your men are my problem. Sorry about that, folks. Amen. But, but, but he, she recognized, amen, you're my problem. And I'm bringing you to Jesus. You're my issue. You're my struggle. And so you're all coming with me. And we're going to go to the feet of Jesus. Right. Hallelujah. Let's lift up our hands and let's worship him. Come on, somebody, lift up your hands, lift up your voice. You got to be honest with God right now. You got to be honest. He's been waiting for you. Amen. He's speaking to you. There's power in that conversation. But he's wondering, will you bring me your problems? Will you bring me your issues? Are you willing to bring it to my throne and bring it to my feet? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the Bible says that she left her water pot behind. If you were to look at that word left and translate it in the English, it can be defined as the English word abandon, which means to forsake completely, to desert, to leave behind, to abandon ship because the boat you're on is sinking to give up completely, to yield control or concern, to relinquish, to surrender without restraint. She looked at Jesus who was offering her living water and she looked back to her water pot, back to Jesus, back to the water pot and recognized, I don't need this anymore. And so I'm leaving it at your feet. She recognized every time I bring this water pot to this well, I got to come back day after day and week after week and month after month. And I'm still thirsty and I'm still needing more. And it only leaves me empty and it only leaves me wanting more. But you mean to tell me that when I get what you're talking about, that I'll never thirst again. If you really are who you say you are, I trust you and I believe you and I'm abandoning this ship because the life I've been living has been taking me down. And the life I've been trying has been leading me to a place. Amen. That's taking me down. This ship is going down. And so I'm about to abandon it all. I wonder if we can lift up our hands and let's pray. Let's lift up our voice and let's talk to God. There's people under the sound of my voice. Amen. That you've been trying everything else, but it's time to try Jesus. You've been trying to, amen, stay afloat in this world, but this world's going down. It's not getting any better. This ship is sinking, but Jesus is going up, but Jesus is going up. The world's going down, but the church is going up. I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of that. But there are too many people that try to hold on to their water pot and try a little bit of Jesus. They're the kind of people that when they get saved, when they come to church, they put their pack of cigarettes in the sock drawer. Just in case. Man, this church thing's great, Brother Sutton. Man, this worship thing's awesome. Hey, you know, but 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 I but just in case I get thirsty for something else in this world, I'm gonna I'm gonna carry this with me. But this woman recognized, Amen. I found what I was looking for, and I don't need this anymore. When you really get Jesus, you'll abandon ship. When you really get Jesus, you'll recognize I don't need this anymore work. I don't need this world anymore. I, I'm abandoning it all behind. Let's clap our hands and let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Let's worship him. Let's praise him.
Let's stand all across the building and let's lift up our hands and let's worship him. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, somebody. You've been trying to live for God and live for the world. You can't be half-hearted about the things of God. You can't serve God and something else. You can't have Jesus and something else on the side. You've got to abandon it behind. Let's lift up our hands. Let's worship him. Let's talk to him. Sir, ma'am, it's been leaving you empty. It's been leaving you longing for more. But when you get this Holy Ghost, when you get Christ in you, the hope of glory, you'll never thirst again. There's no need for this world when you get a taste of heaven. There's no need of this life when you get a taste of everlasting life. Jesus name in Jesus name I got more we could preach but I'm telling you God is moving in this place God's presence is here amen and God's been speaking to some folks for a long time and God's been working on you and God's been moving on you and you showed up to church today just hoping you could slide in and slide out but God's got your number God knows exactly where you are If you're going to be saved, you got to abandon ship. If you're going to be saved, you got to recognize this world is going down. I got to leave this behind. Nothing's worth missing heaven over. Nothing's worth missing eternity with Jesus over. You'll find throughout the Bible, people that really got a hold of Jesus, they left it behind. They abandoned ship. They jumped. They, re they met Jesus. They realized it was what they were looking for, and they jumped over. You might remember that when Jesus came calling, Peter left his nets behind. James and Andrew left their father's business and their boats behind. Matthew left his tax business behind. Mary left an alabaster box, a life of sin, and seven devils behind. And ultimately, they all left this world behind. I've come to tell you, this world is not our home. We're just passing through, and this boat's going down, and I found Jesus. And and he's all that I could ever need. Let's lift up our hands and let's pray. I'm done. Let's lift up our hands and let's worship him. Friend, amen, he's been waiting for you at the well. He's been waiting. I know you're thirsty. I know you continue to thirst. Amen, and you've been, you've been empty. And everything you tried, everything you've done just left you more and more empty. But he's calling for you today. I want to open up these altars. Let's all come. Let's come. Grab somebody by the hand. If they don't have the Holy Ghost, I've come to tell you, he wants to fill you with something that'll quench your thirst for all of eternity. He wants to fill you with his presence. Come on, somebody. It's time to abandon ship. Come on, young person. You've been trying to serve God and live in this world, but you can't have them both. Lord, I love you. Lord, I Lift up your hands and talk with Jesus. There's power in that conversation. There is power in that conversation. Come on, that's it. It's time to leave your water pot at this altar. It's time to leave your addictions at this altar. It's time to leave your sins at this altar. Lay it at the feet of Jesus and watch it bow. Lay it at the feet of Jesus and watch it crumble. Come on, that's it. Lift up your hands, lay your hands on the person next to you and begin to pray. Pray for deliverance. Pray for healing.
don't have the Holy Ghost, today's your day. You've been coming to the well time and time again, but Jesus is here. Jesus is here to fill you up. Just lift up your hands, lift up your voice, and say, here I am. How much I love you.
time to surrender to Jesus. It's time to surrender to Jesus. You've been trying to be strong all by yourself, but you don't need to anymore. You don't need to anymore. Jesus is here. Surrender. 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 I worship you. mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established this was necessary under the law in the Old Testament we read in Deuteronomy 17 6 at the mouth of two or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death and in the New Testament Paul repeated this same principle this is the third time I am coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established every single apostle 
use Jesus' name baptism as their sole name in their formula. Examples are the following scriptures. Mark 16, 15 through 17, Luke 24, 45 through 47, John 20, 23, Acts 2, 38, Acts 8, 12 through 16, Acts 10, 48, Acts 18 and 8, Acts 19 and 5, Acts 22, 16, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Romans 6, 3 through 5, Galatians 3 and 27. So nobody ever used a misapplied title baptism of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's because they knew the name of the Father was Jesus, and the Son was named Jesus, and the Holy Spirit was sent in Jesus' name. Peter said unto those people in the book of Acts that they should save themselves from this ungodly generation. That's in Acts 2.40. Are you willing to follow the word of Jesus and the faith of the apostles? Or be like those on the day of the Lord who claim Jesus was theirs, yet they were cast away because they were still in sin. In Matthew 7.21-23. God bless you as you obey his word.